All right, we made it, last talk of the day. Um, by show of hands, can you please tell me who uses uh, Kubernetes in production uh, on a multi-tenant model? Cool. Uh, who needs some sort of uh, automated provisioning workflow for new namespaces for application teams? Cool. And out of you, who uses OPA? All right. You raised your hand, you didn't. This talk is for everybody. Don't discriminate. <laughs> My name is Miguel Uzcategui, this is my uh, colleague Tim Henricks, and we're here to talk about policy enforcement using OPA and policy as code at Goldman Sachs. So a little bit about me, I'm a technology associate on the Unix engineering team. We provision the compute infrastructure uh, for the company, and that means bare metals, VMs, and now in our days, uh, containers uh, through Kubernetes. So we're the Kubernetes platform providers for Goldman Sachs. And my name is Tim Henricks. I'm uh, the CTO at Styra and one of the co-creators of OPA. Cool. So a little bit of what we are going to talk about today well, is why are we having this talk. Then we'll see how uh, the Kubernetes policy at Goldman Sachs. We'll then look at how we're using OPA to solve this. Uh, we'll step into the, in, through the architecture, some of the future work, lessons learned, and then we'll open it up for questions. So why are we having this talk? To answer this question, we first need to look at how Goldman Sachs is currently running Kubernetes. So a little bit, a little statistics. Uh, we're currently running 12 total sh uh, shared clusters. Uh, as I said before, we use multi-tenancy in which uh, we isolate our users by namespace. At Goldman, uh, namespace have meanings. We can basically tie a, a namespace name uh, to any inventory system at Goldman Sachs. We also call them deployments. Uh, I know it conflicts a little bit with the Kubernetes deployment, but uh, we currently run on VMs. We have an average of 150 namespaces per cluster. And uh, just like everybody else, we run common software like Prometheus, Grafana, Ceph and Rook, CoreDNS, OPA, et cetera. So we're not too different. Uh, at Goldman, we love inventory systems. Everybody runs their own. Uh, an example of this would be uh, group roles inventory, basically who has admin access or view access on certain uh, namespaces. Compute capacity inventories, uh, what names, what people can request for the application names, namespaces in terms of cores and memory. And then we have uh, production access control namespaces, uh, production access control inventories, storage inventories, et cetera. So a little bit, uh, some examples of how Goldman needs policy for their Kubernetes environment. We have RBAC, we need to know who will get admin and viewer access on each of our namespace. Obviously not everybody can have unlimited access across the entire Kubernetes cluster, right? So we need to limit this based on some inventory data. We, have, we obviously don't wanna give unlimited resources to everybody in our cluster, so we need to manage this through resource quotas. Storage, even though we use uh, Ceph and Rook, some people need to mount NFS shares onto their applications. So who can mount these NFS shares on the containers? We need we need to manage it on a per namespace basis. Finally, another example would be ingresses. We definitely had situations in the past where application teams define uh, ingresses with the uh, same host names in the same cluster. And this happened to break Eng the Nginx ingress controller for everybody, which means the cluster was basically down. Uh, obviously, we didn't want this to happen again, so we need to do some validation every time somebody wants to create or update an ingress to, to prevent this situation from happening. Yeah, so the meat of the talk is gonna be focused on how we implement those policies, how, uh, how Miguel set this up at, at Goldman. And so really we're gonna be seeing two different ways of implementing those, some of those policies that you saw on the last slide. Um, the first is well known, uh, um, and, and in both we're gonna be using OPA. And in the admission control case, the first kind of implementation, um, people have heard about this for quite a while. Uh, the way that this works is really uh, the same way that you've heard before, I would imagine, where the Kubernetes API server, on every request it receives, has a pipeline that it sends that request through, starting with authentication, moving on to authorization, and then finally to admission control. Um, and so what we're gonna do is at, the, at that admission control step, uh, we're gonna go ahead and enforce those policies that ensure that there are no conflicting ingresses on the cluster. All right, so that's gonna be one kind of enforcement, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that, but because we've talked about it so many times, and you've heard about it so many times, uh, we're gonna focus more so on the second kind of policy implementation, and we, we call, we're calling this provisioning today. 
So the idea here is that um, each and every time uh, somebody, let's say, creates a new namespace on the cluster, there are a number of resources that need to be provisioned, they need to be created. Um, and so here what we'll see is that uh, we're gonna be creating uh, roles and role bindings, um, we'll be creating volumes and quotas as well. And to drive this point home, um, you can't solve the provisioning problem with admission control. And the reason for that is admission control is designed to allow you to either accept or reject a resource, or maybe at the most you can mutate that resource that comes into the cluster. What admission control does not allow you to do is to create new resources in response to the creation of other resources. That's just not what admission control is for. So that's why provisioning is what we're gonna focus on today. First, I'll give a little bit of, of explanation around how we, uh, uh, Miguel is using OPA to do uh, admission control and enforce that ingress policy. Uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, within Kubernetes, each and every request goes through that, that three-stage pipeline of authentication, who are you, authorization, do you have the RBOC permission to do this at all, and finally, admission control. And in, in, during admission control, the interesting thing is that the, um, the, the admission controller has access to the entire YAML manifest, the entire 50 or 100 lines of YAML that the user has uh, put in place to describe the ingress or the pod or the, or the network policy or whatever. Um, and so at that point, admission control allows us to, to hook OPA in and write rich policies that say things like ensure that whatever host name is being used in this new ingress that the user is trying to create isn't the same and doesn't overlap with any of the other ingresses that are already on the cluster. Um, and so uh, uh, as an example, what we've actually shown here is the OPA policy that, would, that you would write uh, in order to enforce that, the, enforce that only, uh, that there are no conflicting ingresses. And so I won't go in, th in through all the details, but I will uh, sort of talk through it here briefly. The idea is that you're going to be writing a bunch of deny statements, that's the, the typical pattern that we see. Um, and so what you're gonna do here is we're going to deny an incoming, a new ingress. Um, well, we're gonna first check that it's an ingress. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna iterate over all of the new hosts, all of the hosts that show up in that new ingress that perhaps someone's trying to create. We're also going to simultaneously go out and grab all of the hosts that already exist in the cluster for ingresses. That's what the next line is doing. And then we're gonna check if the old host and the new host are, are the same. Here, I'm playing a little fast and loose with what the same means. You could make this more sophisticated if you wanted, but for the sake of a, of a slide, this is a, a good enough check. Um, and then the last line there is just constructing an error message that will return to the user. So the right way to interpret this statement is that if all of those conditions hold, then in fact, the request for a new ingress will be rejected, and the error message that's returned to the user is the one that we're constructing here. So host conflicts with the ingress that we found. Um, so let's take a step back and, and do a very quick intro to, to OPA. And what I'm gonna do here is really highlight the features of OPA that are gonna be important for the rest of the talk. So OPA is a general purpose policy engine, which means that you can use it for a wide array of use cases. Here we're all obviously talking about Kubernetes, but here even within this talk, we're talking about two different use cases, two different kinds of, of, of policy implementations, one within admission control and one within, uh, within provisioning. Um, but generally the way it works is that you've got a service, any service, it could be, be the admission controller, it could be a microservice, it could be really anything that you like, and that service decides that it needs a policy decision. So what it does is it cobbles together all of the information that it has that it need, needs a decision about, encodes it as JSON and hands it over to OPA. OPA returns a decision. The service is then responsible for enforcing that decision. OPA makes a decision, the service enforces it. One of the important things that you'll see uh, uh, later today is that um, OPA, when it receives the input, that JSON object, it doesn't really understand the semantics of that object. It doesn't know anything about Kubernetes pods or ingresses, not natively. Um, uh, but I, as a policy author, when I'm writing my policies, I know what that JSON object represents. I know that it represents a pod, and I know that a pod has containers and images within it. I know that an ingress has hosts. And so I can write the policy, much like I showed you on the last slide, that makes the correct decision for whatever input comes in. So I, as a policy author, understand the semantics of the input, but, J but OPA does not. And we'll see this used a little bit later because, after all, we're using OPA to do admission control, where the input is an, an admission review object, but we're also using it, as we'll see later, uh, to provision 
uh, uh, resources, which is a different kind of input. The second thing that I'll call out here is that um, OPA allows you, when you're making a decision, to return not just allows and denies, not just true-false, it's not just authorization, it allows you to return, technically, any JSON object. You can use that JSON object to represent anything you like. Uh, you could use it to return true-false, meaning allow deny. You could return a string representing a host name, a number representing maybe a rate limit. You could return an array of the clusters to which you want to deploy an application. You could return an entirely deeply nested JSON object that represents an admission review response. You could, as we'll see later today, return an actual Kubernetes resource description in JSON that should be provisioned on the cluster. And so we'll see how that works a little later. The other thing I'll call out here is that Opal also allows you to inject external data in order to make policy decisions. You heard Miguel talk about the inventory management systems that Goldman uses, and this is really important, and what we'll see happen is that those the data from those inventory management systems is gonna be injected into OPA in order to compute the resources that need to be provisioned in any new namespace. So that's gonna be really crucial, and what that allows us to do is have those separate teams that are responsible for the group, uh, the group inventory system and the volume in, uh, and the storage inventory system and the capacity inventory system to still control what the, what the storage and the capacity and the, the RBOC rules end up being, even though they have no control over Kubernetes itself. And so this is a way of helping the organization collaboratively define the policies that in the end get enforced through the mechanisms that we'll be talking about. Um, the other thing I'll, I'll mention here about OPA is that architecturally it is, des it is an in-memory uh, policy engine. It was designed to run at the edge. It was designed to run next to whatever software system needs decisions. It is lightweight. It does not persist policy. Uh, and what that means is that you will need a way of a source of truth uh, for your policy, get is a, is a common one, we'll again see that later, but what you also need is a way to, to distribute policy from that source of truth down to the OPA so that the OPA knows exactly what the policy is. Um, and so that's pretty important. There are a number of ways of doing that. There is a push API that you can use uh, and just push it right into OPA or you can configure OPA to pull that uh, policy and actually external data as well uh, through something we like to call the bundle API. Uh, also, along with management, uh, OPA does allow you to log all the decisions it makes. It's got a bunch of tooling. It embodies policy as code, which means it's got um, a, a profiler, a unit test framework built in. There, there are um, in integrations with VS Code, for example. Uh, there's an there's a OPA playground that you can use and check out. Um, so policy as code uh, all the way. Here's an example, just to drive this home again, uh, showing you the sort of functional uh, inputs and outputs that OPA provides. Here on the top, we have our policy, the policy that I talked through a moment ago. That is one of the inputs that you hand to, to OPA. There is also the, in this case, the, in, in the admission control case, there would be an admission review uh, input that gets handed to OPA as well. That's literally called input uh, in the OPA language. Uh, there's external data uh, in this ingress uh, admission control example. That would be all of the existing ingresses that already exist on the cluster. We'll see later how we can use the inventory management systems as well. Those three things, input policy and data, are all the, are all the, the information that's fed into OPA, and then OPA makes a decision, decision, it produces an output. In this admission control ingress example, we're returning the list of, of error messages that OPA eventually gets uh, returned to the, to the end user. And just to drive this point home, remember, to, or to up-level this again, uh, in this setting of OPA, OPA is a building block that can be used for many different things. We've already shown how you can use it to solve the admission control problem to eliminate, to implement the, the ingress policy that, that Goldman uses. But that's not enough. It's not enough for the other three classes of policies that Miguel talked about. Uh, the RBOC policies, the volumes, the quotas, those all are new resources that need to be provisioned into the namespace whenever that namespace is created. That is not something admission control can do. Admission control allows you to accept or reject a resource um, or maybe even mutate it. It does not allow you to create new resources anytime uh, uh, as a, a, in response to a, a resource like a namespace being created. So these are definitely different problems. And that is what we'll focus on for the rest of the talk. All right, back when we started our Kubernetes journey around three years ago, we had the same problem that we have today, how we provision resources for every new namespace that is on the cluster. So this was our initial approach. We created our own little component, sadly called controller manager, 
like the Kubernetes controller manager, that uh, ba basically what he, what he was doing in the past was getting all the information from uh, all these inventory systems via REST API, getting a bunch of uh, Kubernetes cluster information uh, using share informers, and having all the policy define it in code, in Go code. Then it was making, uh, then what he was doing is continuously running these, po these in code defined policies and applying it through, uh, through basic uh, Kubernetes uh, standard API libraries. Now, this approach happened to be very inflexible. Why? The rules weren't unclear. It was all defined in Go, and if you look at a policy when in some sort of Go code, it's basically a bunch of if statements divided across multiple packages. It was impossible to read, and it was even harder to test. Uh, in addition to this, users had no input into this process whatsoever. We define our own baseline policies in this controller manager that nobody had re uh, visibility into, and the moment somebody needed something special, we needed to create it manually in the cluster. So if, th if something happens to this cluster and the object somehow disappears, then either somebody raised a ticket because they, their application is no longer working, or we recreate it manually. Uh, in addition to these, production releases were needed every time we needed to do any small change in, to some API definition. If you look at Kubernetes objects, there are what, YAML, basic YAML definitions or JSON definitions, it shouldn't be too hard to change. And any time we needed to manage any new type of resources, for example, day one we were managing role bindings, day two we needed to manage port security policies, the, we needed to add a bunch of code to make this happen. Fortunately, we, know, we knew where we were going to get. We, we knew that policies should be simple to understand and granular. Uh, policies should be independent from one another. Tests should back up all of our releases. A change in policy should only take minutes to apply to all the clusters if need to. Uh, and we want, this is important, we want to give the users ability to define their own policies. We as the platform providers, we define a set of baseline rules, let's call it that way, that everybody needs to follow but we understand that certain application teams might, might have special needs, like running privileged containers, for instance. So we need to enable them and empower them to, to define such policies. Of course, they define something that we review, right? We, we are the gatekeepers of these policies. And obviously, no code should change whenever we, manage a, whenever we want to manage a new type of resource or whenever we need to change something simple, like a version on one of these resources. So we're using OPA for this. Um, in the picture above, we still see how we still have controller manager. However, this is a very trimmed down version of the old controller manager, which no knowledge that this runs on GS whatsoever. And we basically offload all the decisions about what resources should be created in the cluster to OPA. So here's how the interaction works. Controller manager will continuously get the namespaces from Kubernetes API using share informers. So every time you create, update, or delete a namespace, Controller Manager will get a notification. After it does this, it will basically ask OPA a simple question. Hey, what resources I need to create for this namespace? OPA will evaluate a bunch of rules, and it will ultimately return a JSON list, where each of the JSONs represent a Kubernetes object, and they might be different types. Controller Manager gets this JSON, and at the end it says, okay, I'm gonna apply it, and it runs a simple kubectl apply command on these JSON objects. So, what are the benefits of this? Well, dynamism to start with. Uh, we can change policy dynamically without having to roll, any, roll out any new code. Since it's continuously being applied, the cluster state will be enforced every so often. It depends on what interval we define and it's totally configurable. And then, well, we have poly, the, all of our policies defined in code in some, sub, in some uh, subversion, uh, not subversion, version control system that we can uh, run unit tests for. And finally, we can, better, uh, we can leverage better all of our Goldman Sachs inventories. And just a recap of what, what these are, group roles, capacity inventory, storage inventory, et cetera. So here's a basic example of what a baseline rule will look like. Uh, and I'm not gonna go too much into it, but if you see at the first line, it's basically validating that a namespace well, is valid. We're not, we don't wanna create this for for our own managed names, namespaces. This only applies to application namespaces. And if it is, uh, we're basically gonna create a resource quota like, that looks like this JSON. Now, this is a standard resource quota, nothing special. The real special part is that the actual data or the actual 
number of cores that you can use or memory is going to come from some capacity inventory, which OPA will have on its data cache, essentially. Let's look at another example. Again, this is an example where we have teams that require something extra on their namespaces. And let's look at row bindings, for instance. We obviously have our baseline rule in which we need to create an admin row binding for those users that need to create resources, that need to create things on that namespace. So if I'm part of a, a random namespace that is not part of, let's call it, the special team X, I will just get this baseline object. But the moment that the namespace belongs to one of the namespace from a special team X, they will get a combination of these, of these, um, of these two objects. How does that happen? Well, it's very simple. OPA has this very cool feature in which if you define rules that have the same name, they will, OPA, what it will do when you query it, it will evaluate both simultaneously, and if they both happen to evaluate to true, you'll get two objects. If one of them evaluates to true and the other one doesn't, you get one object. Um, so in this case of the applic special application X, you'll get the base, baseline object again, and you'll get a special row binding that serves your business needs. All right, so back to what Tim said about, about OPA. You basically need three things to make OPA produce an accurate policy decision. You need, well, policies, obviously. You need data, which we're gonna divide into Kubernetes uh, cluster data, like the ingresses, the namespace, the deployments that you have, et cetera. And you have your, uh, you need, and, and the company proprietary data, right? All of these external inventory systems. Finally, you need a query and then you'll get your output. So let's start with a policy and Kubernetes uh, cluster data. To sync these two, these two pieces of data into, into OPA, we're using this tool called Kube Management. It is a tool developed by Styra, completely open source, uh, with the sole purpose of running as a sidecar container with OPA, and continuously upload policy and data into it using its standard REST API on localhost. So how does it work? For the Kubernetes cluster data, you basically have to only define a, com a, a command line argument specifying which resources you wanna continuously sync, right? And you can control this via the deployment YAML for OPA and Kube Management. Um, and for the policy, what Kube Management will do is it will look at any namespace of your choice and it will look at the config maps inside of it. If any config map in that namespace happen to have rego a compatible syntax, it will say, okay, this is a policy. I'm gonna upload it into OPA as a policy. So if we refer to the left of the picture, imagine this guy here is either me as a platform provider or system administrator, or some application developer that needs something special. They can simply commit their policy into some version control system. In this case, we use uh, GitLab, and we use standard GitLab CI/CD pipelines to push all these policies into Kubernetes as config maps. When Kube management detects that there is a new config map or something has been updated, it says, aha, this is policy. Upload into OPA and update the policy. All right, so we have policy and we have uh, Kubernetes data. Next step, how do I get uh, proprietary data from my company? For this, we're using a, an OPA feature, uh, kind of ties it into the pool, pool, pool mechanism that Tim mentioned that OPA has. It's called, op, it's called OPA bundles. What essentially means is that OPA has the capability of querying external systems via REST API. These external systems, the only thing that they need to comply with is to reply with a tarball. When, that, when OPA gets it, it will, on, it will basically untar it and upload as either data or policy, depending on what it, or what it is, of, on what that tarball has. So okay, so we need, a, we need some sort of uh, observer for this, and we created our own. We created our own component called, we call it GS Feeder, that it's very, very simple. The only thing it does is, again, query Kubernetes via share informers to get all the namespaces that we have in our clusters. And then for as many inventory systems as we want, goes and query each and every single one of them, either via bulk API requests or single, it depends on, this, on each inventory system. It'll get data from them, it'll put them in some sort of JSON that we like, and it'll tar them. And that's it, it'll serve them to OPA. So every, every so often, OPA will ask GS Feeder, hey, do you have any data, do you have any data, do you have any data? If something has changed, GS Feeder will reply with the full, it's called a bundle, which is again, it's a tar file. But if nothing has changed, it will reply, nope, there's nothing new. And 
Opa will just carry along. All right, so we have, again, let's recap. We have policy, we have Kubernetes data, and now we have uh, our own proprietary data. The last step is query and provision. And we have explained this before, right? We use the trimmed down version of controller manager to essentially continuously query OPA. And since OPA already has the data and the policy that we need, it will provide a response to controller manager, which is a list of your JSON objects, and controller manager will apply those objects via standard kubectl apply into Kubernetes. So some things to note about this approach. Uh, one, it's almost completely open source if you exclude the left part of this picture. Uh, there is nothing special about these, right? You have GitLab, you have Kubernetes, you have OPA, you have Kube Management, and Controller Manager, we're actually thinking on open source, so who knows? Uh, the second thing is that it, this is eventually consistent. We don't only run one OPA instance. Uh, we run three or four, depending on the cluster, right, just for scalability purposes. And these OPA controllers might and might not might or may not be in sync at all times, right? Because they all get data from this GS feeder at their own interval. But at some point, they'll, they'll be in sync with each other. So if we happen to query an OPA controller that is out of sync, fine, like we'll get the old version of the resource. Eventually, it'll get in sync with the other ones and we'll update to the next one. So it's eventually consistent within two to five minutes, let's put it that way. Uh, another take away from this, and to me the most important, is that this is failure tolerant. tolerant. It doesn't matter if any of the GS feeder, controller manager, OPA, or queue management dies. Because what will happen, let's say GS feeder or queue management die. OPA either won't have data or policy to reply with. Every time we query OPA, and OPA doesn't have the data, it will essentially return an undefined, I don't know what to do. Controller manager will look at this, well, this is undefined. I don't know what to do either. I'm not gonna do anything. So if anything is down in the environment at any given point in time, we don't affect the runtime of the environment. So existing namespaces that are running applications will carry along just fine. They just won't get any update. Um, the only thing that we will actually interfere with is the provisioning flow, which we'll, I mean, we'll quickly fix. Uh, the last thing to note about this is that if there is any changes in the environment that come from us, like we detect that we need to change something in policy, they will again, since we query continuously, it will be applied to the environment within two to five minutes. A little bit about metrics and monitoring. As Tim mentioned, OPA exposes Prometheus, Prometheus metrics that you can graph. You can do things like round trip time by HTTP method, uh, garbage collecting time, how, you're, how fast you're responding to requests, mean API uh, request latency, and you can do graphs and alerts for any single one of these. It's up to you. So evaluation of results. Okay, we had a problem, we did something, did it actually work? And the answer is actually, yeah, pretty successfully. We now have five minutes turnaround, uh, turnaround time on global policy application. So basically, if something changed, we can deploy very quickly. After we push the deploy button, I mean, we commit our policy, we push the deploy button, it happens within two to five minutes on every namespace. Uh, the scale that we have, we have a mean request round trip time of less than 30 milliseconds. There are 24 rules currently in our environment, meaning that every time we query namespaces, OPA will fire 24 rules for that namespace, potentially returning 24 different Kubernetes objects. That doesn't even, like that doesn't happen all the time because not everybody is special. Uh, we have an average data size of like one megabyte of GS data and two megabytes of Kubernetes data. Something very important to us is that we can fix any issues in the cluster within two to five minutes pertaining these objects, obviously. Uh, maintenance wise, it's not needed. I don't look at this at all unless I have broken something on that GS feeder that I wrote myself or whenever I need to upgrade the OPA or the queue management version but it's pretty standard. Update it, make sure everything is working fine, run some integration tests or whatnot, and release. And then we have received multiple feedbacks that, that this is, uh, that our turnaround times have gotten better overall and everybody's quite happy. All right, some of the lessons learned. Pool model using OPA bundles is more scalable than a push model using OPA API. We used to have a push model where the feeder used to push this, this GS data into OPA. 
this basically was not scale scalable for us. If we wanted to scale up and queue management, we will have to deal with issues like synchronization. What happens if an OPA controller dies? We didn't want to deal with that. And in our case, uh, waiting two to five minutes for namespace provisioning was more than acceptable. Uh, obviously, create metrics and secure your OPA deployments. This is very well documented in the style of uh, documentation, so please read that. Do not upload static data as rego. Uh, this will impact your policy upload times. Make sure you perform and, uh, perform and use and uh, unit test your policies as much as you can. And needless to say, use version control, use CI CD pipelines, they're your friends, they're gonna help you to roll out and roll back your changes when you need to. Some of the future works, uh, we're still expanding on this provisioning workflow. We're gonna start controlling production access through the concept of leases, basically dynamically growing and shrinking the subjects on the admin role binding based on the data from some inventory system. Um, future implementations on this space, as I say, if we feel there is an appetite for this, we might consider open sourcing the controller manager, which will mean we need to do things like maybe creating an operator for, to set up all of, all of this architecture for you, having good metrics like via Prometheus and Grafana, make sure we can horizontally scale this controller manager, et cetera. Um, so that's it, thank you. Awesome. Any, yep, I questions? Think, I think we have time for one question. No, uh, no. <laughs> but it's the last, it's the last session. I think we can all run long. We can keep you here as long yeah, as you yeah. wanna be here. <laughs> feel, feel free to approach me after if any questions as well. Hi, my question is, is it just a security measure for you or is it also a compliance uh, generator? Excuse me? Is it just a security measure for you or is it also a compliance generator? It, it's basically compliance. We, 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 we wanna make sure that, um, that everybody's running up to like a set of policies that we deem correct. For example, pod security policies. Do, do your auditors, uh, auditors accept it as a compliance? Do your auditors accept it as compliance evidence? What do you mean? I'm not following. You're a bank. You have to prove to the regula reg regulator you're in control. Do they accept the output of OPA as compliance evidence? Yeah, I mean, like, like obviously everything we do, we do, we do run by our security team, and they have looked at this, and they deem it. Okay, thank you. More. One more question. Over there. Uh, let me. Hi. So I, <clears throat> I was looking at your diagram that you put uh, the inventory this? management one. Yeah. Can you explain like a small, like how does, and you said that the, I mean, can you explain the workflow, like how does it, what the inventory management system, I mean, what is it receiving? And I mean, a short example to illustrate how does it enforces, uh, what does it get back from the inventory source and how sure. does it apply, like in, in real, just a simple example. So let's say a new namespace was created and this is namespace is called Miguel. This happened to somehow tie down to GS inventory systems, right? There'll be information about Miguel in there, the namespace Miguel. GS feeder will get this update from the Kubernetes API, and it will say, okay, I need to query the group roles inventory, the capacity inventory, the storage inventory, and others. However, how many we configure? Let's say we do for groups. It will basically ask via REST API to our groups inventory. Again, it's proprietary, it's our own input output format, but it's a JSON, right? JSON Send a JSON, say, hey, the namespace is Miguel. Tell me what information do you have on your records for this. The group roles inventory will respond, well, the admins for the namespace Miguel are gonna be Miguel and team, and the viewers are gonna be, I don't know, uh, Jack and uh, Rodrigo, right? We'll get that information, we'll fund it once we get it from these inventory systems into whatever JSON format we think we wanna query it in our policies, and we'll basically tar that up into, into a tar file. At that point, like, it just sits there, right? This feeder is a server. OPA will query periodically this feeder service, and it will detect that a change has happened, right? Like, it's not the same tar that I had before, essentially, and it'll pull it. When it pulls it, it'll say, okay, there is new data. I'm gonna put this data as is on my in-memory cache. And then it's up to us on how we use it in the policy. 
Does that answer your question? Yes, that answers. So it means, let's say, if you create a namespace, uh, probably it's not in your inventory, then what's in your inventory? Sure. Uh, Let's say that happens. First of all, in, in our environment, that really cannot happen because before you create a namespace, it needs to be in the inventory. It's like, like the, our provisioning work, like our orchestration workflow that won't let you do that. But let's say it happens. What it will happen then is that when controller manager queries OPA about namespace Miguel, which is not every, anywhere, OPA will try to run the policies. And it will say, well, you know what? I don't have the data that I need to compute this policy. I'm going to return undefined. So at this point, controller manager will say, oh, I don't know what to do with this. I'm not going to create any object. So how would you fix this? Well, you actually put your data in this inventory system. And as this thing, this thing is self-healing, the feeder will continuously ask about namespace Miguel every so often. So when that data becomes available in the inventory system, the feeder will get it, OPA will get it, and next time we query via controller manager, your, your resource will be provisioned. No, we don't, we don't expire. Like basically, like again, to create, an, to create a namespace in our Kubernetes clusters, you need to be registered in our inventory system, like before any of these. So, so now. Yeah. What, what is Kube Management doing? What does it? Sure. Uh, so the, the role of Kube Management is to sync policies, right? Let the feeder basically syncs GS data, GS specific data. Kube management basically syncs policies that are defining config maps in, our, in a Kubernetes namespace. And it also syncs uh, Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes specific data that we need. Some of our policies require to know the current state of the cluster, like the one that Tim showed about the ingress, for instance, that needed to know like, which ingresses are in the cluster and what host names they have, right? So Kube management can do does that via share informers. Awesome. Well, I think that's all the time we have. So thank you guys for coming out. Um, and I think they're going to be closing the conference center pretty soon. Mm. Yeah. So well, we'll still hang around. They'll have to kick us they, out. Yeah, they'll if kick us out. If you have more questions. <laughs> <All> right. <laughs>